It is 1.42 a.m. local time, and you are looking at the Falcon 9 standing on pad 39A at Florida's Kennedy Space Center. Good evening or morning, depending on where you are. My name is Lauren Lyons, and I'm a Dragon System Certification Engineer here at SpaceX. Today we're launching the Echostar 23 satellite to geostationary transfer orbit. The 90-minute launch window opened up tonight at 1.34 a.m. Eastern Time, but due to high altitude winds at the beginning of the window, our current T0 is 2 a.m. Now, if you look closely at the rocket or that pad shot, you might have noticed that Falcon 9 looks a little bit different. There are no legs, there are no fins, there's no recovery hardware. The reason for that is tonight we're not going to be attempting a landing, which makes this what we refer to as an expendable launch. But the ascent phase will be like all of our other flights, from the lighting of the nine Merlin engines on stage one, to stage separation, stage two flight, and then all the way on through to spacecraft separation and geostationary transfer orbit. As the webcast goes along, we'll explain more about what it means to be an expendable rocket. We'll tell you about the Echostar satellite and about the overall mission that we're going on today from start to finish. So let's get started. Hi, I'm Michael Hammersley, a materials engineer in our avionics department, and we are in the depths of the witching hour at Kennedy Space Center tonight. You can see Falcon 9 standing on the pad at 39A at Kennedy Space Center. This will be our second launch from this historic pad. Apollo astronauts launched to the moon from here, and the space shuttle also got its start here and had 80% of its launches from here. Um, you can also see some residual hardware from the space shuttle program. We have the fixed service structure uh, through which the astronauts actually entered the space shuttle and the rotating service structure which would uh, spin around this pivot point and this leg would encapsulate the space shuttle and you'd uh, load the payload into the shuttle bay uh, from that structure. Uh, Falcon 9, of course, standing here, as Lauren pointed out, no legs, no fins, no recovery hardware as we're not going to be recovering the first stage for this launch. Um, the first stage will get the satellite to the edge of space at about 100 kilometers. Uh, the second stage will continue powering the satellite up to about 8 kilometers per second into a low Earth orbit at first and then into a geostationary transfer orbit to release the satellite at the very tip of that orbit. Um, the satellite itself, of course, Echo Star 23, is sitting inside the fairing. It's that composite a carbon fiber and aluminum honeycomb structure protecting the satellite during ascent. Um, the transporter erector is supporting Falcon 9 at the moment. Uh, this is a, in, an upgraded version that can support both Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. Uh, it, rolled the saddle, or it rolled Falcon 9 out and tipped it up in preparation for launch. Um, at, we've got about a mile southeast uh, at Slick 40, that's Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Uh, both can launch cargo dragon and commercial payloads like, to, like tonight, and Falcon uh, is getting ready to go. We are currently approximately 15 minutes for our, for our, from our T0 time of 2 a.m. Eastern Time. We are launching Echostar 23 today, a communication satellite built by Space Systems Loral out in Palo Alto, California. And it'll be launching with the company's flight-proven SSL 1300 spacecraft bus. We'll be taking Echostar 23 to geostationary transfer orbit approximately 35,000 kilometers above the Earth. After the satellite separates from stage two at approximately T plus 32 minutes, Echostar will deploy its solar arrays and use its onboard plasma thrusters to adjust its final altitude to geostationary orbit. So question, why is stage one going expendable today instead of landing on the drone ship or back at landing zone one at Cape Canaveral? Well, that comes down to performance, which in today's case is governed by two main things. One, spacecraft mass, and two, altitude. At 5,500 kilograms, Echostar is one of the heavier spacecraft that SpaceX has launched. And at that 35,000 kilometer altitude, we have to take it up pretty high. So to achieve that combination of a big heavy satellite and a really high orbit, it means we need to use every last bit of fuel that we have on stage one in order to go higher and faster. Uh, we're actually going to be going approximately Mach 30, so that's really, really fast. And that speed and that height leaves little propellant left in the tanks, not enough to fire those engines for precision landing either downrange or back at LZ-1. So as we did before we started landing stages, after stage two and echo separate from stage one, the booster will continue along a ballistic trajectory downrange. So this means like we, we won't have footage of stage one of Falcon 9 after stage separation as we have in the past, but we will keep our cameras on stage two for as long as we continue to receive signal as we locked Echostar 23 to its targeted orbit. 
Once EchoStar is operational at geostationary transfer orbit, it will provide Brazil with direct-to-home television with an estimated lifetime of approximately 15 years. Good evening, my name is Tom Perderio. I'm a firmware engineer in the avionics department here at SpaceX, and tonight I'll be filling in for John Innsbrucker. So that means that through the rest of the countdown and the launch, I'll be bringing you live status updates from the webcast desk here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. Uh, currently, we are about T minus 12 minutes till liftoff of the Falcon 9 rocket carrying the Echo Star 23 payload from Kennedy Space Center in Florida. All systems are currently go for launch at 2 o'clock sharp a.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time. Uh, as Lauren was saying, our launch window is about two and a half hours long. So if at any point during the countdown you hear a hold, hold, hold call, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're done for net tonight. It just means that we've decided to pause the countdown, and there is a chance that we'll be able to recycle and uh, get the rocket launched within that two and a half hour window. Uh, however, currently the team is working no issues, and uh, we're looking good for liftoff in just about 11 minutes right now. Uh, earlier, the Falcon 9 was rolled out to the pad at about T minus 17 hours. Our rocket, uh, our high-grade rocket kerosene fuel, RP-1, is currently loaded onto the first stage, and we're just about done loading the rest of it onto the second stage. Uh, we did hold at uh, T-minus 20 minutes to load the rest of our cryogenic helium into the storage tanks on top of both the first and second stage, and we're currently finishing final liquid oxygen load on both stages of the rocket. Uh, we currently uh, have a green light from the Echo Star guys. The, uh, the team is saying that their satellite is on internal power and ready for launch. Uh, looks like the range is good to go. And uh, weather, uh, we had a little bit of a weather problem. High altitude winds were pushing our limits uh, just a few minutes or a few hours ago, which is why we decided to hold the launch for a half an hour. But it looks like at T minus 10 minutes and just about 30 seconds, uh, weather is good to go. Their winds are finally cooperating. And we are ready to uh, see this Falcon 9 uh, lift off in just about 10 minutes right now. So there have already been a few names and organizations mentioned. And I'd like to clarify who's doing what and what each of those roles entail. Uh, SpaceX, of course, is the launch provider. We control the environmental effects on the satellite during launch and ascent. We make sure that the thermal, vibrational, and shock loads, along with humidity inside the fairing and a few other parameters, are all below or within certain agreed-upon thresholds so that the satellite will survive its journey into space. SSL manufactures the satellite to make sure that it can survive the harsh environment of outer space for its 15-year lifetime. And they've built plenty of satellites. Over the past 60 years, they've built 84 that have gone to geostationary orbit. The overall design, called the BUS, is the 1300 platform. And that platform uses lithium-ion batteries, just like laptops and phones, and also electric propulsion to maneuver itself on orbit. Echo Star is the organization that chooses the payloads, uh, mostly consisting of the antennas, to put on the bus that SSL builds. And then they will manage the Echo Star 23 satellite as part of its larger worldwide fleet. Echo Star and SSL have partnered together for many years on more than a dozen satellites. And two Echo Star SSL satellites flew just last year. Now, Echo Star shared with us a short video that describes how they intend to use this satellite once it gets into its correct orbital position hanging out over Brazil. Echo Star Corporation is a premier provider of satellite services and technology solutions. Headquartered in Englewood, Colorado, and conducting business around the globe, we are a pioneer in communications technologies through our Hughes Network Systems and Echo Star Satellite Services business segments. These branches generate over $1.8 billion in annual revenue. Our Hughes Business Unit is the global leader in satellite broadband for home and office, delivering innovative technology solutions and a comprehensive suite of managed services for enterprises and governments worldwide. HughesNet is the number one high-speed satellite internet service in the marketplace, with offerings to suit every budget. A leader in satellite communications, EchoStar Satellite Services manages the world's fourth largest commercial geosynchronous fleet of 25 satellites. We provide communication services worldwide for media and broadcast organizations, direct-to-home providers, enterprise customers, and government service providers. Today we are launching EchoStar 23, a highly flexible KU-band broadcast services satellite. It features four main reflectors and several sub-reflectors to support multiple mission profiles. EchoStar 23 will be deployed at the 45 degrees west orbital location, providing high-powered direct-to-home services into Brazil. We're excited to launch for the first time with SpaceX and their Falcon 9 vehicle. 
After launch and in-orbit testing is complete, our new Echostar Spacecraft Operations Center in Sao Paulo, Brazil will provide Echostar 23's telemetry tracking and control services. Thank you to our partners at SSL and SpaceX who have contributed to the success of the Echostar 23 program. This will be SpaceX's second launch out of historic Pad 39A, the same pad that sent Apollo astronauts to the moon, the space shuttle to the International Space Station, and soon we'll be launching Falcon Heavy and commercial crew. But today there's also some history. This is going to be the first ever commercial communication satellite ever launched from this pad. Now, 39A was renovated and customized to support Falcon launches and needed to be resilient enough for quick turnaround for high launch rates. One of my favorite things about the new pad that supports this is the, su the new super beefed up transporter erector Strong Strongback, or TE Strongback, which is capable of launching Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. So a couple minutes before liftoff, you'll see the Strongback slowly retract approximately one and a half degrees. And you've seen a similar retraction angle with the other TEs. But with this strongback, it gets even more interesting. As the Falcon 9 engine's light and the vehicle begins to ascend, the strongback leans back 45 degrees in order to clear the way for Falcon 9. What does that do? Well, it helps to provide liftoff clearance from the stage two cradle arms, which are holding the second stage. It also protects the TE structures and the umbilicals, and the umbilicals are the lines that feed the rocket its power and its fluid. It protects those structures from blast damage that could be caused by the Merlin engine's plumes on ascent. This leads to increased pad survivability and thus faster pad turnaround for the next launch. For example, after today's flight, the pad's going to be safe by the team and prepped in time to launch the next big historic mission out at the end of this month, which will be the first reused orbital class booster. The strong back leaning back also just looks really, really cool. It's <laughs> one of the other reasons why it's my favorite, so keep your eyes out for it at liftoff. This is Tom with another status update. We are currently just about T minus five minutes and 20 seconds until liftoff. That's two o'clock AM sharp, Eastern Daylight Savings Time. Currently the rocket is reporting go. Uh, the team is working no issues. We look on track for our launch. Uh, we're currently pressurizing the second stage of the rocket, which is one of the last things that we do right before liftoff. The next big event to look for is the strongback retract, which Lauren was just talking about. That strongback retract is going to begin with the clamps at the very top of the strongback uh, releasing. You'll be able to see that on your screen. And then it'll uh, tilt back just about a degree and a half. Uh, of course, the full uh, recline will happen once the rocket leaves the pad at T minus zero. We also began the Merlin engine chill at T minus seven minutes. This is when we flood the turbo pumps on the nine Merlin engines at the bottom of the first stage with super cold liquid oxygen to get them down to their operating temperature at negative 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, the team also checked out the TVCs, which are the thrust vector controllers. These are the mechanisms on each engine that allow us to steer them. Uh, we make sure to, that those things are operating perfectly uh, in, in order uh, before every launch, and it looks like the team is satisfied that they're good to go. Uh, the next thing you're going to hear in the nets, once we turn it over to the pad, is uh, T minus one, you're going to hear that the vehicle is in startup. What this means is that the Falcon 9 flight computer has taken over control of the rocket and is ready to count it down through the rest of that minute all the way to launch and then to orbit. Uh, so it looks like, in summary, uh, Echo Star, the team has reported that their satellite payload is good to go. The range is still reporting good to go. Weather, it looks like the winds are cooperating with us, and weather is a go. Uh, so with everything looking really good for the launch, uh, let's turn it over to the pad cameras and the countdown nets and uh, count down to the launch in just about 3 minutes and 30 seconds. FTS is armed for flight. Last three minutes. GNC verify stage two TVC motion nominal. Stage two TVC motion nominal. Stage one box load close out. Strong back lowers ended. Strong back at eighty eight and a half degrees.
stage one launch load is acceptable for flight. Stage two lock slow is closed out. Vehicles himself on. DC, verify Falcon 9 is in startup. Falcon 9 is in startup. Minus 30. All gas calls us complete. T minus 20. Stage 1 tanks pressing for flight. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, one, zero, lift off, lift off. And you're looking at the first stage of the Falcon 9 rocket after a successful liftoff from Kennedy Space Center. The rocket is just about to pass through max Q, which is the maximum aerodynamic pressure that the rocket will see throughout its entire flight. Normally we see a shockwave right around this time forming, but it doesn't look like there's going to be enough light to see that shockwave. Sounds like Max Q is passed and we've throttled back up those Merlin 9 engines. Merlin vacuum bleed in has started. This is when we chill down that MVAC uh, engine on the second stage, just like we did for those first stage engines. currently looking like the trajectory looks good. There's a few events that are going to be happening in rapid succession very soon here. Uh, the first one is going to be the main engine cutoff of the first stage. So those nine Merlin engines are going to shut off directly after that. A few seconds later, we're going to have uh, 10 seconds after that, we're going to have uh, stage separation of the first and second stage. And then immediately following stage separation, 
we're going to see the second stage engine start up. And as you can see, it looks like uh, stage separation was successful, just waiting for that second stage to start up. And we have a successful startup of the Merlin vacuum engine of the second stage. Uh, second stage looks nominal, and back D is looking good. Uh, right now, that Merlin vacuum engine is uh, burning away. Uh, we're getting a nominal prop and nominal trajectory from both the from the second stage. Uh, let's uh, take it down to the floor and uh, see what's going on. Okay, you just saw a successful stage separation and a successful light of the MVAC engine. Uh, that's a really big, um, a really big milestone. Fairing separation. Uh, you, you did just yeah. see the, the oh, fairing. Oh, we just did. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Sorry, you couldn't see it. That's great. Uh, that's a huge, uh, a huge milestone for us. So again, MVAC has started up. It's burning. We separated that fairing successfully. You know, up in the vacuum of space, you don't need it anymore, so we ditched it. Uh, it's still quite a quite a sophisticated system, the fairing. Apart from c protecting the, the spacecraft during ascent and uh, preventing excess humidity buildup and, and shock loads and things, um, it's also got a really cool system called the re-radiation system. Uh, just like we don't want to launch our rocket if we can find something wrong with it that needs a little tweak before launch. Same with the satellite. Except you've got only one chance to, well, I guess you, you're not able to fix it once it goes to space. So anytime before then, if you can fix it, you want to. Uh, but the fairing, being that carbon fiber composite uh, with aluminum honeycomb, is a Faraday cage. Uh, that means you can't get electrical signals in and out very easily. And so you've got a hardware system that will take signals from the satellite, pipe them just to the outside of the fairing, and then re-radiate those signals out so that everyone can listen in and make sure that the satellite is, is still healthy. Uh, that's only active before ascent. In this case, we're not actually using that system during ascent. Now, typically around this period of time, we'll be checking in on stage one. We have those onboard cameras, we're watching the grid fins. But today, again, because this is an expendable launch, we don't actually have a camera on stage one. And again, the reason we're going expendable is instead of coming back down to LZ1 back at the Cape or going down to our drone ship, of course, I still love you, or just read the instructions, is because we needed to use all of the propellant that we had in order to get the performance that we needed to put Echo Star 23 in its intended orbit. But this is like every other rocket launch in history. We've gotten used to these landings, right? Um, but sometimes we have to do it this way. And so uh, it's still a super awesome launch, right? So why don't we go on up to Tom and get an update from him. Just another status update for you guys. Uh, looks like the MVAC engine is performing nominally on the second stage. Uh, good engine temps and good fuel consumption rates. Uh, everything is looking really good in that second stage. Uh, like Lauren was saying, this is a little bit different. Usually we're tracking the first stage coming down for a landing right about right now, uh, but that is not happening this flight. Uh, but the second stage is doing really well, so that's really good news. Uh, we are just about halfway through the first burn of this second stage. Uh, this is an MVAC D that stands for Merlin Vacuum D. It's the same type of engine that we have in our first stage, but specialized for the vacuum of space. Uh, this engine puts out 210 thousand pound feet of thrust uh, and that nozzle you're seeing on your screen right now that red hot nozzle it may look small uh, in the picture but it's actually 10 feet long and about 10 feet in diameter so this is a massive nozzle a niobium alloy radiatively cooled nozzle extension to make sure that we can uh, get out the uh, get all of our performance out in the vacuum of space right now and that continues to look good uh, there's a trajectory is looking really good right now and all telemetry from the second stage is looking healthy Right now, the Merlin vacuum is operating at just about full thrust, uh, producing about four Gs of acceleration. We begin to throttle it down as the propellant burns off, just so we can keep that acceleration in check. Uh, the next big event is going to be at Seco uh, 1, that's second stage engine cutoff 1, at about T plus 8 minutes and 30 seconds, so about a minute from now. Uh, after that first stage, the second stage engine uh, shut off, we're going to have a brief coast period of about 18 minutes or so, and then we'll be lighting it again. Uh, so, to sum everything up, the second stage is looking really healthy, MVAC-D is looking really good, uh, so just a few more minutes left on that burn. So, 
Like our typical geostationary transfer orbit missions, this one is two burns separated by a uh, coast period, followed by a, the payload deployed. Um, we're in the midst of that first burn, and as Tom mentioned, the next coming up is the coast. And that second burn to transfer from low Earth orbit to geostationary transfer orbit. Uh, now, low Earth orbit is a tight circle around the Earth. So you start, if you, my hand is the Earth, uh, we start on the Earth, and low Earth orbit is, is uh, a low altitude moving around quite close to the surface. When we move into geostationary transfer orbit, we change it from being a circle up to an egg shape. Uh, and that's by, by having a burn just at the bottom. Uh, and so then that, the top of that geostationary transfer orbit is about 35,000 kilometers, uh, which is geostationary. Uh, geostationary distances. It's from there that the satellite will be uh, circularizing that orbit to get to the, the, the true geostationary orbit that we're hoping for. And so we're going to be dropping off Echo Star at the apogee or that farthest point of that orbit. And as Michael said, uh, we're gonna, it's going to use its onboard plasma thrusters in order to raise uh, the orbit to its circular geostationary orbit. Um, and once it's up there, it'll be able to use those same thrusters for station keeping to maintain orbit for 15 years. So we just heard the, the cheers from the crowd. That's from the second engine cutoff. Uh, so it, we're in, moving into that coast phase at the moment. That's uh, 17 minutes where it's going to be hanging out in that low Earth orbit before boosting into that geostationary transfer orbit. You can see on the screen there's a live animation of the satellite over the Earth. Or we're switching to second stage engine camera. Um, but you'll uh, be able to follow the satellite uh, during that coast phase, come back afterwards for the second burn, and payload deploy shortly thereafter. It's about 17 minutes long, so we're going to kick you to that, but definitely come back. There's a ton more left to go.
This is Tom Perderio from SpaceX headquarters, just bringing you a quick status update on the second stage. Uh, currently, uh, we're about to start our uh, second engine, second burn. Should be coming up in just a few seconds here. And it looks like, as you can see, uh, we have confirmation of a successful second engine start. This is the second of two burns, the final burn that our second stage is going to be performing today. Uh, this burn is going to last for just about one minute, and then it'll be uh, taking off. This burn is necessary to get the Echo Star payload into the correct position for deployment, which will be happening a few minutes after the second engine's second cutoff, coming up in just about 30 seconds now. currently throttling that MVAC engine to make sure the acceleration stays within the bounds we need. And it looks like a successful termination of uh, thrust, a successful second engine, second cutoff. Uh, like we said earlier, the Echo Star payload is going to deploy just a few minutes uh, from now. So hang tight, watch the uh, animation, and we'll be right back.
welcome back. We got confirmation of a all right, welcome back, everyone. We got confirmation of a, sec of a successful second engine shutdown, and we know that we are now in a good orbit. And coming in very soon, we're gonna have payload deploy. Now the satellite, the EchoStar 23 satellite, is mounted onto stage two of Falcon 9 via what we refer to as a payload adapter. Falcon 9's flight computer will then send a separation signal to that payload adapter. That, detect that signal will be detected via brake wires, and the satellite will actually separate from the second stage of Falcon 9. In order to give it that little delta V that it needs to push away from the rocket, there are four springs in that payload adapter that'll give it a, gently, a gentle push off on its own path. Uh, at that point, um, it's going to uh, unfurl its solar panels, start collecting power, start transmitting back to Earth, and head towards that geostationary orbit over Brazil. Um, now, geostationary, uh, just a, a quick reminder, is where the satellite appears as if it's always in a fixed point in the sky. You can see the animation on your screen. Once the satellite gets into the right spot, uh, that it, oh, there we go, it, it, it's doing a second burn, transfer from that that tight low Earth orbit into that egg shape and then circularizing. And there you can see that line shows you that it's always floating above the same point in the ground. So that means that even if you're looking at the night sky and, and usually the stars will rotate over the course of the night, the satellite will always stay in the exact same spot. Um, geostationary orbit is a particular type of geosynchronous orbit. The two terms often are used interchangeably. Uh, geosynchronous just means that it, it passes through the same point once a day. If it isn't true geostationary, oh, now we have a beautiful confirmation of spacecraft deployment. That, that is Echo Star 23, having just been sent off on its way to continue along with its mission, successful spacecraft separation from Falcon 9. And with that, actually Falcon 9's job is, job is over for today. Uh, spacecraft is going on to begin its mission and begin that uh, solar ray deployment and orbit raising, but that brings this webcast to a close. Yep. Uh, quick recap, we had a, uh, an almost on-time launch just to get around some of those high-altitude winds. Uh, first stage successful launch, second stage two successful burns with that coast period in between, uh, not recovering the first stage because of the re re performance requirements of this mission, um, and that, that successful payload deployment that you just saw. And just some thank yous to everyone who helped, that helped with the success today. First, a big thanks to the range for providing range safety and assets. To the Federal Aviation Administration, or the FAA, thanks for giving us our launch license for today. To our customer, Echo Star, we wish you, wish you much success with this satellite and its 15 years of service. To SSL, who built the satellite, thank you for your continued partnership with SpaceX. And to all of you out there, the viewers, thanks for checking it out. And uh, if you want to follow us, check out us out on social media. You can see us on Twitter at SpaceX. You can follow us on Facebook. And if you want to come join us here in Hawthorne at one of our launch sites, go to SpaceX.com slash careers. Uh, be safe tomorrow with St. Patrick's Day. We survived the Ides of March. And a happy birthday to Einstein, who would have turned 138 this week. Don't forget about Pi Day. Why would you celebrate Pi Day? <laughs> because to not celebrate it would be irrational. <laughs>